Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Get Cooked. My name's Sarah Cook and each week I'm interviewing members from our rowing community both here in Australia and around the world. And this week I'm very excited to be talking to Katie Folks, former Australian coxswain for the women's age, two-time Olympian, mother of two children, two daughters. We've just been talking about how crazy life is uh, for her these days. But Katie, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Now let's get into where it all started for you. How did you get into rowing and specifically coxing? Mm. I think like many others, it's all started at school. So I went to a boarding school in Ballarat and um, in one of my very first few, first weeks at the school in year seven, the um, PE teacher or the head of sport at the school approached me and noticed, I guess, what he thought were two key, really important factors for coxing. One, I was small. So, you know, at 11 years of age, I think I weighed about 38 kilograms. I was, you know, fairly short. Um, so that's, you know, that was a nice little bonus to, for a cox. And the other component in his words were, was that I was smart. So I was there on an academic scholarship. And so he thought that this was the magical ingredients um, for a great cox. So he, yeah. <laughs> so he basically encouraged me down to the boat sheds and, um, and that's where it started. Um, interestingly, I guess by the time I was in year nine, um, I was coxing the equivalent of the senior first crew and we won um, the Ballarat head of the lake. And, you know, for those of you that come from those environments when you, you, comp you compete at the head of the river or at the head of the lake, you know that it is the be all and end all of sport. And so we won this race, we won head of the lake and I actually retired from sport or from coxing after that because um, I really had a sense that I had reached the absolute pinnacle of my career. That is, that's a really interesting <laughs> concept because, you know, we, we often joke and, and call the head of the river the schoolboy or the schoolgirl Olympics because mm -hmm. there's so much build up around it and it's mm -hmm. almost like life and sporting career ends as soon as you cross the finish line of that event. But the thing certainly that I try and impart on the rowers that I work with is that you are part of the fabric of a much bigger and broader sport, not only in Australia, but globally as well. Rowing has such a place in sporting history, whether it's the Olympics, Henley Regatta, which is over 180 years old, US College Rowing. You know, there's so many different pathways and opportunities and you realise that you're actually a piece of, um, you know, a very, very big puzzle. So that's uh, really interesting that you actually experienced, I guess, what I, I thought I was seeing in some of our school-aged rowers. So I guess the question mm -hmm. is then, how did you make that transition mm -hmm. into going into, was it club or university or then ultimately Australian representative rowing? Mm. So, you know, I think when I was in about year 10, I did a little bit of coaching and I'd, I'd use that word very loosely I think I sat in speedboats and you know shouted a few instructions um, but it really wasn't until I started university that I got back into it so I went to Melbourne Uni and I lived at one of the colleges there and it's a fairly I assume it's the same these days it's a fairly tough selection pro process to get into a college and so you 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 know you add to it as well as your academic results you add all of these extracurricular activities that you do and of course then there's a bit of an expectation that you actually do them <laughs> so <laughs> when <laughs> yeah there's that piece that I didn't factor in so when it was um, rowing season for the college I agreed to get to get back into a boat and um, for whatever reason I was selected as the top cox at the time I do not know why and I coxed the men's college crew and um, from there I can't really remember how this happened but someone from the Melbourne Uni Boat Club approached me and asked them to come and join ready for the InterVarsity Regatta and do you know, my memory at the time is there were some amazing rowers in Melbourne at the time and, and as part of that, there were some amazing coaches riding their bikes along the bank. So, you know, someone like Noel Donaldson, um, 
you know, would have been on the banks and as an ex-cox, I've got no doubt that he was listening out for, you know, who he thought might have a little bit of talent. So someone picked me up in that group and asked me to, to join the InterVarsity crew. And I don't actually remember feeling that excited, but this kind of sense of, okay, well, I'm also at Melbourne Uni, I should, you know, do, do my duty. Um, and what I didn't realise at the time is the crew for that Melbourne Uni InterVarsity crew, um, a chunk of them had just competed at the Atlanta Olympics. So this is about 1997. Wow. They'd just come back. And all of the other members in this crew had rowed at a state level. So you can imagine there's me that, you know, had retired from coxing in Year 9. Um, and then I jump into this boat and it was just amazing. It was by far the best boat I'd ever been in, but the buzz and the excitement from being in that boat and going so fast. Um, I don't remember actually saying much as a cox in some of those early sessions because I couldn't sense anything that needed to be improved on at that point in my career. <laughs> um, but that's where I really got hooked. And, and, you know, that level, that, you know, I love going fast, the boat speed that came with that, the level of professionalism that came with that was a real hook for me. Um, and then I think it seemed like the climb in my career from that point to national team happened pretty quickly. Um, so uh, we raced into varsity, um, we won that event. Uh, I was then in a number of um, crews and kept winning races, which, you know, is always helpful if, you, if you're looking for selection down the track. Um, made a youth, the state youth crew, we won that, um, racing for the first time on the Sydney Olympic course. So that was very exciting. Um, and then before I knew it, I was getting invited up to the national camps, which um, in those days were held in Canberra. Um, and I guess the, uh, an interesting part of the story in this um, is, so I'm on the national camps and in those days, if you wanted to be in the women's aid or particularly if you wanted to cox in the women's aid, which was the only coxing spot at the Olympics for females at the time, you basically needed to have a scholarship at the AIS. You needed to be the AIS Cox. And I'm on these national camps and for whatever reason, again, a little bit of luck and a bit of talent scouting, I was offered this scholarship to move from Melbourne to, you know, leave my friends, leave uni and head up to Canberra and, and live this life which you know, from many people's perspective, was almost a ticket to the Sydney Olympics. So this is back in about about a couple of years before the Sydney Olympics. And so I had this, this ticket. And what do you think this young, some might say arrogant young Cox decided to do with that opportunity, Sarah? <laughs> Did you turn it down? I turned it down. <laughs> yeah. And, do you know, I can't even necessarily explain now why I did, except that I had this really strong sense that it wasn't the right time for me. And I think in hindsight, I'd been on a number of these national camps and every camp I was on, I felt like I was coming up against a different cox, a new face, a new person that I was in a boat next to competing against. And I think one of the messages that I must have learnt through that process is a sense that you only were going to get one shot. And so if you messed it up, that was it. And for whatever reason, I didn't feel ready to have that shot. So, um, of course, I didn't have a chance to put that explanation behind it. No one really cared. I was just this young thing from Victoria who, you know, I think was, was definitely perceived as being too arrogant and was sent back tail between my legs to Melbourne to get on with the rest of my life. And I did. I got back into my uni and my studies and it was only a matter of a couple of months later where I started feeling like I really wanted that spot. So up until that point, I enjoyed going fast. I enjoyed being on the camps. I loved winning races and going as, you know, doing as well as I could. But I didn't have that real, I guess, fire in the belly to go after the Olympics, which I think you, should, you know you need to have if you're going to be at that level. 
So a couple of months later, I decided I did really want that spot. And um, from memory, I called the head coach up at the AIS. And not surprisingly, he didn't really care. <laughs> you know, he, he wasn't going to open his arms up and, and, you know, hold the entire scholarship and development program for me to make up my mind. So the long and short of it is that spot no longer existed for me. Um, and I don't know about for those, for you, Sarah, or for those listening, but for me, you know, if I get told I can't do something, it tends to really drive a desire to, to prove them wrong. So the nationals were coming up, the national championships, and I knew that the AIS were putting a women's aid on the water and they had a long history of winning this race. Um, I also knew that I wasn't going to get a seat in that boat. Someone else had that spot. And so my solution to all of this was to put together my own women's eight and try and beat them. It's perfect sense, really, isn't it? Um, so I remember ringing around uh, people in Melbourne, many of the athletes I didn't know, I hadn't met, trying to describe who I was and what I wanted to do. Um, I needed to, you know, ask a number of favours to find a boat and some oars and all of those, you know, vital pieces of equipment to sit on a start line. Um, and in the end, I got a red hot women's eight together. And so we went down to Tassie and um, I remember going up to the start line and it was a really windy day and, you know, I grew up rowing in Ballarat, so I knew how to handle the wind. <laughs> I and I read the race reports from the Ballarat Olympics and they are just horrific. So yeah. Yeah, I don't <laughs> doubt it. So I remember this moment watching, um, you know, the AIS crew struggling to get into the starting blocks in the wind. And, you know, I might be exaggerating in my memory, but we just zipped on in, you know, <laughs> probably not quite that smoothly. Naturally. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> Naturally. Um, and the long and short of it is we won that race. And we won it by a big margin. And my memory is pulling into the pontoon and the head coach of women's rowing at the AIS at the time coming over and offering me the scholarship. Well, I think what's really interesting about that is it's not even the race winning or anything else. I think what you want to see in an athlete and particularly in a coxswain is mm. that kind of drive and initiative. Mm. When you were told no, you didn't just slink away and get on with the rest of your life mm -hmm. you actually found that fire had the resolve to then really take it on mm -hmm. and go above and beyond what most people would probably do in that situation which I think in itself are exactly uh, the attributes that you would want in in a top level coxswain so I think that mm -hmm. you know the course of action that you took really demonstrated that you had that drive and that skill set yeah, absolutely. And, and, and not surprisingly, you know, for, for many of us, it's so easy to look back at our history and think, oh, that person's been to however many Olympics and it all looks, you know, so smooth on a bit of paper when you see an outline of results and, uh, you know, what appears to be a natural progression through the system. But, you know, there's so many stories like that of those that are deemed to be successful have just had to turn towards really tough times and and make something good out of it. Um, and as you said, it wasn't, I mean, the race win was fun. But for me, what came from that was almost this long-term motivation. You know, I, I, I had to find ways of making it happen myself as opposed to a sense of it being handed to me. And I think that really stuck with me in years to come when more challenges, surprise, surprise, came my way or I was feeling a bit worn out or whatever it was. I'd often think back and think I made a very deliberate choice to be here and I'm really pleased with that choice I made. And it kept, it kept me going on the, the tough days as well as the good ones. Absolutely. And that's one of those transferable skills that we talk about um, in sport is that resilience piece mm -hmm. and being able to take that not only into other scenarios in your sporting career, but into other aspects of life and your professional career and no doubt being a mother as well. Uh, so all of that is applicable. Uh, and, and I think that's a really important 
thing that we, particularly as athletes, when we finish our first career in sport and then we look for that, um, that second career effectively is understanding and being able to articulate what the skills are that we have developed over our time. It might not be on a piece of paper in the form of a degree, but we come out with an incredible experience and, and toolkit of skills and attributes and being able to, uh, like I said, articulate that um, to be able to make that step um, mm. into a professional career is really important. So I love that you mm. actually actively draw on some of those experiences to help get you through difficult times. Absolutely. But I will, I will say on that, um, there are certain skill sets that I've only recently realised that I had. Um, and that's, you know, 15 years post-retirement um, where, uh, you know, some things that I just thought I intuitively did uh, or just learnt at some, uh, some point in my life and assumed others, you know, had that skill or had that capability as well. Um, so it takes time. It does take time, but, you know, if you can capture some of that throughout your career, that would be something that I would actually encourage others to do is, uh, you know, even on a really loose level, keep some kind of journal or map of your career where you're actually, you know, highlight some of the key points and what was it that you brought to those, those components, not just a, the race wins, the times that you were pushed out or really challenged and what strengths and um, talents and abilities and skills you brought to those um, because they're the pieces that I draw on more so. Hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic advice for any of our uh, young athletes who are listening to this now. Hmm. And so let's talk about, and, and I often find myself doing this, you know, you mentioned that we think it's going to be a linear progression, uh, which the theme I think throughout all of these has been that it is not. I don't, I don't know that I've spoken to anyone who had a linear progression with no setbacks. So it's mm -hmm. great, I think, for people to be able to hear that and understand that the journeys are not linear, that they are all over the place, upwards, down, backwards, forwards, sometimes yeah. feeling like you're going around in circles. But to not brush over, I guess, the, the, um, the steps that you went through mm -hmm. and obviously getting that AIS scholarship was key for you being able to reach that next level. And like you said, then putting you in the box seat for mm. the Sydney Olympic Games. So let's talk about your national representation, your first Olympics, and then what you learned from that to then take into the next Olympiad leading up to 2004. Mm, absolutely. So, you know, I've just told this story about, um, you know, getting this scholarship and, Again, if you, you read it on a piece of paper, you'd then see, you know, the next thing on my on my rowing CV, if you like, is competing at some world championships, so obviously selection on the Australian team and then on to the Sydney Olympics. So it just looks so straightforward. All I had to do was jump that one hurdle. But, you know, in, in reality, I got the scholarship, but the head coach still had doubts about me, about my, my level of maturity. And in some ways, I think the selectors saw me turning down the scholarship as a sign that I, that I wasn't ready. Even by that point, I thought I was. Um, and of course, uh, with, any, with any team um, event or process that you go through, you need to build trust with your teammates as well. So do you know, I remember going up to the AIS and joining this squad and you know, this sense that I could not do a single thing right from the way, and I'm not exaggerating, from the way I stood on the pontoon and stepped into the boat, you know, the coach at the time gave me a hard time about. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caveat all this with, he's an amazing coach and we've stayed in touch. But it's just that sense of, you know, all of a sudden, I was a sense of starting right at the bottom. And... You know, I think my approach to that was, okay, I need to, I need to get really good. <laughs> I need to make an Australian team and not just make an Australian team. I need to try and be one of the best in the world. And, and how will I do that? So it became a bit of planning and um, um, a process-driven approach, if you like. Um, so I remember this one particular day going to the girls at the AIS squad 
and I'd got this bit of paper. This is, you know, before the days of apps and phones where I probably could do it online now. But I got a piece of paper and I'd drawn down the middle of the piece of paper on however many coffee, copies, 14 or 16 copies. And on, on the left-hand side, I asked them to write, you know, what are the things that I'm doing well as a Cox? And on the right-hand side, what are the things that need some improvement? And um, in those early days, on that first particular occasion, I'm going to say there were 14, 15 athletes that completed these forms. And in total, I had one comment on what I did well. Mm -hmm. And it was something that at the time I didn't think I could even control. It was something like, your voice isn't annoying. I'm like, oh, great. And there must have been, I mean, in my head there was 200, but I might have exaggerated over time. There must have been 40 or 50 comments around what I needed to improve on. And, and let's put this into context. Here I am with the AIS scholarship. So in theory, at that time, I should be the best female cox in the country, if not one of the best. Um, so I had this list of all of these things that I needed to improve on. And not surprisingly, some of them contradicted each other. So it wasn't like I had this really straightforward plan. But the best thing about that process is it just gave me a structure. So each night I'd look at, okay, what's the one thing I've got? I've got a, a non-annoying voice. Okay, great. Keep that. Work that non-annoying voice. <laughs> um, but I also, you know, I added my own things to it. You know, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll persevere. I'll keep going. So I added my own bits that other people hadn't seen yet. What got me here in the first place? So I had my list of strengths. And then I would pick each day or before each session one or two of the elements from the list of what you need to improve. And so that was one thing. It gave me a goal for each session and each day. But the more important part of that in hindsight was probably two things. One, my crewmates saw me rather than worrying or stepping away from this feedback, they saw me turning towards it and really trying to understand it and do something with it. And that alone, I believe, was one of the best strategies I had for building trust with my team. The other thing is it gave me a really solid reason to go and have some good conversations with my teammates um, rather than just chatting about the weather, et cetera, which, you know, I could do. I asked them to really flesh out what would this look like? What would I be saying? What would I be doing? What would you feel? How would that make a difference to boat speed? So I fired questions at them. And again, that helped me meet what they needed and it built trust um, for the team. So, you know, over time, and I think it was over about four or five months, that I kept doing those lists. And not surprisingly, about four or five months later, it came back and there was not a single thing on the what to improve side. And the what you're doing well was the long, the long list. Um, but then I had another challenge on my hands. I didn't, I didn't want to be the best for this particular group of people. I wanted to be one of the best in the world. So then I needed to go further and think really broadly, how else could I get really good at what I do? And, you know, I don't know about these days, but there was certainly no manual out there for how to be the best cox in the world. No one had written that book or that, you know, <laughs> that podcast. Um, so I just, I remember mind mapping um, everything that could potentially make a boat go faster because that's ultimately what I needed to do. And so I had on there um, things like, you know, the athletes needed to be in good shape. So I needed to have an understanding of physiology. I needed them to um, mentally be in, a gr in great shape. So I needed an understanding of sports psychology or clinical psychology. I needed to understand how boats work to go fast. So I needed to understand the physics, the levers, the biomechanics, etc. So that's the approach I took, was to learn everything I possibly could about what made boats go fast and, as part of that, what made people make boats go fast. Um, so it was kind of a clinical approach, if you like, but, again, I just learned so much from so many people and then felt it wasn't about 
me not performing if I had a bad day. It was about me selecting the wrong goal for the day or the wrong strategy for the day. And so I never, um, well, that's probably not true. I really felt my, you know, I really gave myself a hard time. It, it was almost a little bit of distance between me and my performance. Okay, tomorrow, different strategy, different approach, try it again. Um, and so I learned really, really fast. Now, I feel like I've digressed a little bit there, but the point is... <laughs> no, I think, I think it's really great what you're saying and particularly, you know, coxing is so hard and, and I often find that coxswains don't understand how to develop and even as a coach, mm. I haven't been in that position and so actually everything you're saying is giving me some great ideas and I've got a couple of really talented coxswains who I'm going to say, all right, you need to listen to this because... Mm -hmm. Some of the tips that you're giving um, are, you know, definitely, I think, a little bit out of the box, but really, really great ideas on mm. how a coxswain can train in the same way that a rower would train or approach their training or, or how they're going to improve their development over time. So I think that you're giving Absolutely. some really tangible, um, mm. really helpful advice um, yeah. for anyone who's listening who is coxing or for coaches who are listening and trying to think of how they can actually improve um, their athletes as well. And so let's talk about um, your Sydney Olympic experience. We're 20 years on now, which is hard to believe. 20 year anniversary, I think, in September. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, having gotten through those hurdles and, and this approach and now finding yourself as the best coxswain in Australia and, and like you're saying, buying to be one of the best in the world? Mm. I think... So there are a number of things. I mean, by that point, so the Sydney Olympics was my third national team, if you like. So I had a, a, a reasonable about amount of international competition under my belt. And again, by taking that, that um, approach of consistently learning and using all of those previous regattas, despite only being quite young, I, I can't actually remember how old I was at the Sydney Olympics. I have to quickly do the maths there. But... Um, I think I was around 24. Yeah, I would have been. Um, I felt at that point in my career a sense of I, I had done everything I could at that point to be performing at the best level I could for that regatta. And that was an amazing feeling. Now, of course, I looked back years later and I could tear my performance apart and think of a hundred other things that I could have done better. But at that point, that sense of confidence if you like that this is as good as I can be right now was really really important for me um, what was really interesting in terms of the Sydney Olympics was some of the things that um, it's not that I took them for granted but I almost didn't allow myself to experience some of these components that I now look back on and think wow what you know, what an amazing experience. Um, do you know, I can remember getting ready for the opening ceremony and, you know, I, I know a lot of the time in rowing because we compete so close to the timing of the opening ceremony, we often don't, don't choose to walk in the opening ceremony. But there was a choice made given it was our home Olympics that we would, we would, we would do that. And I believe that was the entire team, but it was certainly the rowing team. And I remember standing outside the stadium and being our home country, we went in last. And, you know, so I, my self-talk was, and, and also my talk to my teammates, was about just, just managing the levels of arousal. So we don't want to go over the top. We want to save some energy for racing and just enjoy this process. So kind of keeping it all at this level, you know, being cool, calm and collected. Um, and so as part of that, I remember listening to the, you know, each country getting called in to go into the stadium and an enormous roar and crowd for each country, but also just getting used to that level and feeling okay and keeping heart rates low, et cetera. And then, and it was exciting, but it was like, okay, it's this thing that we're doing. It'll be a good experience. We'll look back and think it's great. And then this moment when Australia was announced and, you know, I still get goosebumps now, 20 years later, 
I can't even describe the noise of the crowd. Like it just went up tenfold and it was like the stadium was shaking. It was unbelievable. And, you know, instead of being with that moment and then possibly putting in some recovery strategies for the next day to to get some energy back, I found myself kind of playing it down in my head. Now, I don't know whether that was the right or the wrong thing to do in terms of performance, but I often look back at that and, and think I almost took that as just a part of the, you know, part of the journey as opposed to really being completely present in that moment and thinking how unbelievable this is and how few people get to experience that. So there were moments like that which were, you know, it's taking me a long time to look back and go, that was just such an incredible moment. Um, But then as part of that, you know, there was a sense of, I think, additional pressure coming, you're feeling like you you are performing um, in front of your home crowd and that came with wonderful things, but also, you know, a a sense that you kind of needed to do more. And that was probably one of my key learnings from that that whole games was to, to go in and do what you do. Don't suddenly at the last minute add all these bits to things because that didn't work for me and I don't think that worked for our team. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting and I there's always this, um, I think, focus on being in the bubble and, and shutting things out and being present and focusing on performance. But I think, mm-hmm. like you, particularly as time's gone on and I've thought more about being present, about mindfulness, working on some of these skills, actually are we shutting these things out to the detriment of of our own um, emotions and and potentially performance impact. So I think it's a really interesting, um, you know, area that is probably growing and, and how do you, yeah. of course, manage your levels of arousal and, and yeah. being able to stay focused on your performance and not just throwing it all away, but also at the same time allowing some of those those feelings to, to come in and, and sit with them and be present and actually allow them positively to, yeah. to drive that performance potentially to another level. So really interesting um, that you look yeah. back and, and think about it in that way. And, yeah. and I guess, you know, to, again, not to move through too quickly because we've only got a very short amount of time, but you following then the Sydney Olympics where you'd really been on this, I guess, upward trajectory, um, even though we, we've discussed that it wasn't linear, um, mm-hmm. you then went into the next quadrennial as the top coxswain. You mm-hmm. won the world championship in 2001. And so I guess, you know, that whole Olympiad would have had a very different focus and a very different expectation for you. So talk us a little bit through that, but also then your experience in 2004 as well as your second Olympics. Mm. Well, actually, um, so I was a, a little bit of an, um, a different one in that squad in that I actually stepped away from the squad after the Sydney Olympics and um, I took an opportunity over in the Netherlands and coached over there for a couple of years, um, which, again, was maybe a silly thing to do in some, you know, to some people's perspectives because I'd got to that point where I was, you know, number one in the country and... Um, But again, I just had this feeling like I needed to broaden my experiences and my perspective to be able to bring that into the team for the next next round. Um, So I went away for a couple of years and, you know, not surprisingly, rowing continued without me. (laughs) The Australian team were really successful in that that point. Um, And then I got a call back um, just before 2003 to see if I wanted to come back on the team and the timing was right. I had been planning on coming back. Um, But, you know, it's like I have this this, um, attraction to challenge at some point because it it wasn't a smooth transition back, even though I'd had the call up. Um, I had to fight my way back onto a team and I had to build trust with people I didn't know again. But I took a really similar approach and was fortunate enough um, through a pretty challenging ride to be selected 
from 2003 and then onto the Olympic team for 2004. And, um, do you know, so many, so many um, interesting experiences through that, through my own challenges, etc. cetera. But, um, do you know, I guess to talk about what might be the elephant in the room for some, um, do you know, and I should probably explain to those younger generations, our, our performance at Athens um, in terms of the lead up, I will say was one of the best, if not the best crew I've ever been in. Um, such a positive, for me, such a positive season. Um, absolutely loved every single training session. Um, loved all of my teammates. It really was a highlight of my career, which is really interesting because for those that maybe don't know, the performance at the Olympics was um, in many ways counted as quite a public failure. I don't use those words, but others do. Um, and so, you know, that was really conflicting in my mind. Um, and I should, I should say for those that don't know in that, in our particular final at the Athens Olympics, um, one of our teammates, uh, stopped rowing through the race and the fallout of that, um, on an individual and personal level was huge, but, um, more confronting, I think in some ways on the short term was the media attention around it was enormous. So, um, you know, that's been a really interesting process. One, because so much of that season, as I said, was so positive, but then the messaging around it, particularly from others, was so negative. And so that was really um, confusing and, and challenging to work out. But then the other part of it is, you know, I've avoided talking about it for so long. Um, I mean, what is it now? 16 years. And this will be one of the first times I'm actually, I mean, I just brought it up. I didn't even mean to bring it up. So here we go, Sarah, I'm bringing it up. <laughs> well, I, I think in the discussions that you and I had leading up to this chat, mm. it what I thought was really interesting was that you hadn't spoken about it. You said that you had never created a narrative around this that you give. And, and when you have something like that happen, you do come up with a narrative when you talk about it, but it does require talking about it a number of times before that starts to form. But the yes. interesting thing for me was the catalyst for you to actually want to talk about it. And it related to having daughters and or having children and the message that you were sending to them about something bad happens Mm. Do I just lock it away and never talk about it again? Or is that the best way to deal with something like this? So I, that, when you mentioned that, I thought, actually, this is the really interesting takeaway from this conversation. Absolutely. And, and you're spot on. I mean, we all know this. And goodness, I work in a, a psychology space. I work with human behaviour. So I rationally know this, that the more you avoid something, that the harder it becomes to talk about it. As you've just said, you don't have the narrative and I think I had this sense that I would um, miraculously come up with this beautifully crafted story, a bit like a movie with a, you know, great moral at the end of it and that this story would just kind of dawn on me and I'd have this, you know, story to tell others. But realistically, that, that hasn't happened and I still don't have the perfect narrative to explain what happened. Um, and in some ways... I can't even make a whole lot of meaning or sense from it. But I also understand now, and goodness, I think considering we're in a global pandemic, we might all understand now that sometimes things happen and we can't make sense of them. But we still can choose to tell a story, tell ourselves a story about it and continue to move in a direction that is important to us, whether it's towards goals or aligned with our values or whatever that might be, um, to not let us hold, it, hold us back. Um, and the other thing I was reflecting on, Sarah, since we spoke about this briefly last week, is, you know, this concept that you can choose your own narrative for your own story. Um, you know, even if I think about my rowing career, you know, I, I could tell a story and, and it would all be the same, it would all be truthful. 
I, I could tell a story of being, you know, people trying to push me out of a system after I turned a scholarship down um, in my early days and then having an uphill battle to earn trust of the coach and then having another uphill battle years later and I could... I could even tell you about how I was banned from the boat sheds from the Australian squad training in 2003 when I was trying to get back in the boat or um, I could tell the story around Athens of feeling disheartened and upset. But that's only one version of the story and it was never a story that sat well with me. I tend to be a pretty positive, optimistic person and so I think I needed to tell myself a different version of the story. Um, you know, the rowing career was I made the right choice when I turned down a scholarship. And, yeah, I had to earn the trust of people, but, geez, when I did, it was worth it. And um, almost this confidence when I was banned from the boat sheds that, wow, they think I'm so good, they can't even let me in the boat sheds, never mind me, you know, letting me in a boat. Um, but then if I think about Athens, um, the story really that's starting to come out from, you know, from inside, I guess, is this story that despite everything, despite a rumoured history, despite experiences that we, we had, we still sat on a start line and we came flying out of the blocks and we got into a great rhythm and we had the best first half of a race we've ever had you know, I had these amazing teammates that dealt with this unpredictability that and continued to remain loyal to each other and stick with their values. Um, and they lined up on a start line, even in the presence of uncertainty. And if I take myself out of that picture, I mean, that that's high performance, right? Sitting on the start line when you, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so that can be this, that can be a narrative, and I think the story we tell ourselves on on any experiences in life is so important. But as I said, there's days that I need to remind myself of my strengths and my achievements, and they're scattered through the very same story as the one that was splashed on every front page of every newspaper in Australia at the point. But for so many years, I let the wrong story hold me back, as opposed to it being. Um, I guess a story about you know some of the things I just talked about loyalty, trust, resilience, etc. And I think that it's really incredible where you have gotten to and the view and the lens that you put on not only on that event but on your entire career and the way that you process and are able to talk about everything that's happened in your career and frame it. So for me it's not a surprise at all that you have moved into the direction with your career that you have in, in the psychology space, but also in coaching and leadership and mentorship. Can you tell us mm. a little bit about what you're doing now? Mm. Uh, because you're doing some really exciting stuff and I've participated in your um, PhD study as an interviewee um, mm. and I think it's really interesting. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So... Um the, what I'm doing probably falls in a couple of buckets, and this is aside from being mum, wife, pet owner, all of the other things that make up life. Um, so the main part of my work is um, a high-performance coach and consultant. So really that's about leveraging all that I've learned from being around all of these amazing people um, to support individuals, teams, organisations to perform. So... You know, if you look at my CV, you'll see that there's a, over a decade in senior leadership teams and organisations, but then I also, so I draw on that, but then I draw on my science background, my psychology background to leverage from methods that are actually based in scientific evidence to enable performance. So I'm really passionate about that. But the part in that I'm probably more passionate about is something called a systemic approach. So it's not just about looking at an individual or a team. It's about what's everything around those people that impacts how they behave and how they operate. But even more excitingly, how can they impact much bigger systems? How can their behaviours ripple out really broadly to families, to organisations, to communities, etc.? Um, and then the other part of my work that I've 
got into more recently and I'm loving is the research that you've just mentioned. And a, a key component of my research is on the topic of resilience. Um, and so through a recent master's degree at Sydney Uni, I met um, Dr. Michael Kavanagh, who he's really leading the way in terms of critiquing the, I guess what you call the standard approach on resilience. Um, so, and I'm going into dorky mode here, but I love this stuff. Um, you know, so often when we think about resilience, we think only about the psychological skills of an individual. And some of the research that we're doing is, is looking at, well, what's the impact of only drawing on those? So I'm talking about things like perseverance, um, creativity, like looking for solutions, being mentally tough, all of those amazing things. But you know, some of this research is highlighting that just drawing on those is exhausting. It comes at a cost. And so we're looking at what other resources could people draw on outside of themselves to help navigate challenges. And really what comes from that, for those that want the real, what does this look like in the real world, is it means that as leaders or as head coaches or as coxes or whatever in business or sport is we need to create these environments that have a whole lot of resources for people to draw on for either challenges that they're facing right now or challenges that we don't even know about. Um, and then the final piece I should mention is based on performance and resilience. I'm actually um, founding a couple of product products, One's, one that's launching in a couple of weeks. So the one in a couple of weeks is called The Coaching Companion, and it's an online tool to support leaders to engage in coaching conversations. Um, also doing a, an online course called The Performance Project for individuals that are looking to enhance their ability to perform under pressure. And then um, another one called the Future Movement, which is for organisations um, about really building resilience for their people. It's really exciting. It's mm. some really innovative strategies that you're talking about. And mm. if people want more information, they can check out your website, Katie yes. Folks, F O U L K E S dot oh org. <laughs> uh, so that's got all of the information. If anyone listening is is interested in these um, services and uh, platforms that Katie will be launching in the near future. So, Katie, I've had a very interesting question, actually, um, from a listener, mm -hmm. and this has been a topic of conversation, certainly at a world rowing level. I'm involved with the broadcast, and we've spoken about this a bit. Do you think spectators should be allowed to hear the cocks and calls during live broadcast racing or perhaps share their video? Mm. Do you know what's an interesting one? Um, I just don't know if it would be that meaningful to people. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's actually something that I, I try to convey to people is I'm like, you actually probably won't understand what they're saying, like in no. terms of, because the calls have meaning to that crew at that time. And so they'll hear it and go, what? What does that what even does mean? That mean? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you think about, I mean, there's months of turning these really complex, long winded, you know, sentences into something really short and sharp for a race. Um, I mean, if I think of any, I'm trying to go back into coxie mode. It's a long time ago. Um, so if I think about, you know, thinking about the catch a few months before uh, or even years before a race, it might be talking about being light on your feet into the front, being poised, wheels gliding into the front, listening to the boat, thumbs coming up, getting ready to change direction, do you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm not <laughs> going to say all of that in a race. Um, in a race, it might be just a move or a, um, a noise, a ch ch like something that gets all of that result. Um, but the other piece there I think that gets missed sometimes in coxing is it's, it's kind of like it, it is leadership and, and that's about relationships. Um, yes. I don't know. If you just hear a snap, a tiny bit of snippet of that, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to get much. Yeah, I agree. I think that's quite interesting. People should mm. just be happy listening to me talking about the racing on, on World Rowing. <laughs> exactly. I should. Goodness me, Sarah. Absolutely. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Keep the coxes silent. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's move on to our fast five, our final five questions of the interview. So we ask all of the guests these questions. Mm. What's your favourite rowing course to row on? Ah, uh, easy. Lucerne, Switzerland. It's been the popular choice, the mecca of rowing, I have to agree. Yep. Uh, top track to erg to. Do you erg? Have you no. erg? <laughs> I have erged. I used to do all of the cross training with the girls apart oh, from the ergs. Um, so top track to erg, I don't erg. What about run to? Do you, do you like listening to music or are you a non-music kind I'm of I'm a non-music, um, although I for many years used to rehearse race plans in my head when I did exercise and now 20 years later I still have race plans going through my head. So I've now taken to a podcast to try and get myself get out of my own head. Yeah. <laughs> Understandable. Uh, the best piece of advice that you've been given? Hmm. I don't know if I was actually given this, but certainly role modelled um, through my dad was to a love of learning and curiosity, just to use every opportunity you can to ask questions, to observe, to learn from others. Hmm. And particularly poignant, not just as an athlete, but in everything that we do in life as well. So that is a great one. Mm. Your career highlight to date? Mm. Uh, I would, I mean, sitting on the start line of the final at the Sydney Olympics was pretty special. But I think when I look back, the highlight generally was all of those times that... I don't know, I got the underdog crew, every piece where someone tried to give me a rough time and we beat the others. I love being the underdog and I love proving others wrong. So that's a theme, I think. Yes, definitely. It always makes those victories a bit sweeter, doesn't it? Yes. And the final one, the hardest session you've ever done, and this could be as a Cox or... Probably as, as a cox, I'd be interested to know this one because we hear from the athletes what physically the hardest is, but for you as a cox, uh-huh. what was the hardest? Um, do you know, it was definitely when we were doing race work, um, I don't know if you did similar sessions, where you do something like 250 on, 250 off. And so you're really practising those sessions, those sections of a race. And I think why that was really difficult is you're in full race mode, as are the athletes, but then if the boat isn't going as fast or the boat speed's not coming easily, you've got a really short period of time where you're A, talking the crew through that in-between time, trying to get them to recover, and you're also mentally trying to go, what on earth do we do for the next one? How, what's, the, what's the thing we need to do next? So I used to find that really draining. Um, but I also can't not say from a physical perspective, geez, I hated those hikes in St. Moritz. <laughs> I I totally agree. I hate hiking. It's the worst. <laughs> You've got long legs. I know, I know. That doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> well, Katie, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure being able to interview this morning and hearing some of your incredible insights. Mm. And I think that there will be a lot of people, coxswains, athletes, and and uh, you know people who are interested in the sport in hearing some of your insights and and takeaways. So thank you very much and all the very best um, with some of those platforms and with your research and and all of the exciting things that you have coming up. Thank you. Thanks so much for involving me. It's wonderful to be part of it all. And if anyone ever wants to reach out just for a chat, I'm always willing to have a virtual coffee. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Sarah.